During the time ancient Israel was divided by civil war, God sent a prophet named Elijah to the people in the northern kingdom. Another prophet named Elisha worked alongside Elijah as an apprentice. One day, Elijah was preparing to travel to another city and asked Elisha to stay behind. But Elisha said, As surely as the Lord lives, and you live, I will not leave you. So Elijah and Elisha set out together, traveling to three different towns in the region. In the first two towns, groups of other prophets approached Elisha, asking him, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Both times, Elisha replied, Yes, I know, and told them to keep quiet about it. As they departed each town for the next, Elijah asked Elisha to stay behind, and he refused. One day, the two prophets reached the edge of the Jordan River. Elijah took off his coat, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided, and they crossed on dry ground. After they crossed, Elijah asked, Tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah said. If you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours. Then a chariot and horses made a fire of it, separating the two of them, and Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind and disappeared from Elisha's sight. Elijah picked up Elijah's cloak that had fallen on the ground, and he struck the water, saying, Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And the water divided in two like it had for Elijah. A group of prophets who witnessed this miracle said to each other, The spirit of Elijah is resting on Elijah. From that day on, Elisha carried on the work of Elijah, continuing to perform great miracles. Welcome to New Hope Community Church. It is great to have you with us today. I know what's happening today. We have Harvest Fest today. So after 12.15, we're having lunch on the grounds. So some of our 9.15 crowd, which normally fills this sanctuary, they're sleeping in today. And they're just coming to hang out. You guys get to go home, change clothes, come back. You can be first in line. All right? 1215 right out there. I'm sure you already smelled as you walk by the tri-tips are barbecuing. Uh, the Charton boys who do the uh, tri-tip for the rodeo every year are out there preparing the tri-tips for us today. So at 1215, come back to the Harvest Fest. Enjoy lunch here on the grounds. It's free, no charge. Best tri-tip you'll get anywhere. Tables will be set up. Activities for the kids will be out on the grass area. And just kicking off Harvest Festival and Halloween week here at New Hope. But welcome to worship this morning. If you are visiting for the first time, there are visitor cards in the pew in front of you. I would love for you to fill it out, drop it in the offering bag. Let us know of your presence here today. And then next week through the mail, we'll send you information that tells you about New Hope. Always promising never to beat on your door or bother you on the phone, but through the mail, send you information we hope will be very, very helpful for you. Let me get a sign-up sheet going around before I get into the announcements and prayer requests. We have an immediate need. We have a service here on Tuesday, a memorial service for a family connected to our church, uh, the Snavelys, and they have had a challenging couple of weeks. Actually, they've had a challenging couple of years. Young married couple, uh, their first baby was born prematurely. Some of you remember us. We prayed for them during that time. Baby was born early, died. We had a memorial service for them. Uh, they are expecting. In fact, their second child is due next month. And all is going very well, and we are grateful for that. But a week ago Friday, we, uh, we did Amy's great-grandmother's memorial service. And now this Tuesday, it is Brandon's uh, grandfather's service. Had the opportunity to meet him just Saturday a week ago and have prayer with him. And uh, his name was Billy, and so that service will be here on Tuesday, and we need some help with desserts, bottled water, and rolls. And so if you can help, uh, we need these things here by 11 o'clock on Tuesday. So uh, underneath is the sign-up sheet for the uh, women's uh, homemade bake sale that's going to be on November 9th out there. You all have already signed it over the last couple of weeks, but anybody missed it, bring your best homemade dessert dish. And you know what? If you make a great quiche, 
uh, bring that. That would be great on a Sunday, all right? If you do that better than you do pie or cake, bring. And I, I prefer bacon, no mushrooms. Uh, <laughs> just, 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 just saying for what that was worth. All right, but uh, anyway, if you didn't get to sign it, that's on the bottom sheet, so please find a place to sign to bring up for that, and uh, that is a fundraiser for our women's ministries, helping needs outside the church, so they would love to have you do that. Let me highlight a few things. Next Saturday night, you need to do something very, very... Oh, yeah. Uh, Milo's on the computer. I never know. All right. Um... Well, you guys, I love the idea that you guys are looking up, though, in church. That's a good thing. You're looking up. Um, next Saturday night, you need to do something very important. Next Saturday night, you need to do something very, very important. You need to change your clocks. Okay? That's next Saturday night. All right? If you don't change your clocks, you'll show up at the wrong service. Okay? And so make sure you change your clock. You're going to fall back, okay? So when you go to bed at 10, it's only going to be 9. So you get an extra hour sleep, all right? So you ought to be well rested, no napping during service, all right? Uh, all right, our homeless outreach is next Sunday afternoon after our, uh, after our last service. At 12.15, gather over in the Murbach building. They'll prepare the lunches to take and deliver as well as uh, the various goods that they will distribute to help with uh, the various needs that are there. Uh, on Sunday, November 9th, that is Veterans Appreciation Day, our U-Bake sale that will take place between the services. If you picked up a shoebox uh, for a child to go overseas for Christmas, please bring that back. Uh, there are some instructions in the bulletin. Please take the opportunity to read that. And there is a small group leaders meeting at 1045 on Sunday, November the 9th in Holy Grounds. Uh, if you're a current leader, they would love to have you there. If you have interest in being a leader, a facilitator of a small group, we need to start one or two more new groups. And so they would love to have some of you with those interests to join them as well. On November 11th, it happens to be Veterans Day itself. Tuesday, November 11th is the second Tuesday of the month. That means it is Senior Luncheon Day, all right? And this is not just another monthly Senior Luncheon. This is the November Senior Luncheon. This is the Thanksgiving feast, all right? Uh, the ham is provided. The turkey is provided. The dressing is provided. The mashed potatoes is provided, all right? You are to bring a dessert or another side dish that would complement a wonderful turkey dinner, all right? If you have never been to a senior luncheon, this would be a great way to start, all right? Uh, it's a great way to meet other people. If you are 55 or older, all right? If you're still working, come for lunch, all right? If you're retired, some of you are 65, 66, and you're saying, I'm not old enough for senior lunch. Yes, you are. I'm there, and I'm not 60 yet, all right? And I have lunch with them. So come join us, all right? We'd love to have you. Uh, thank you from all of us as pastors for your uh, wonderful kindness last Sunday as you demonstrated your appreciation in so many different ways. For the cards, for the calls, the emails, the gifts, we simply say thank you, thank you very, very much. Last Sunday night was, uh, was a great, great joy. We had a baptismal service here on Sunday night. We baptized eight. Their names are in the bulletin. In fact, if you are in this service and you were baptized last Sunday night, raise your hands. All right, you were here, back there in the back, right here, right back there. All right, congratulations, guys. It was a wonderful, wonderful night. We got to do a husband and a wife married over 50 years together. That was so exciting. We got to do uh, a young man and a young lady, uh, 25 years of age, both of them who accepted Christ sitting in a pew during our Believe series, all right? So in the last 10 weeks, they came to know Christ, and that was so exciting. And uh, so just a thrill to share with those eight. When you see them, give them a hug and tell them congratulations, all right? Uh, a few prayer requests. Uh, Jim Critchfield uh, got results back from his PET scan this week. Um, it's kind of in middle-of-the-road news. Uh, liver is doing good. It's not. Uh, the, it's still in check. A couple of new spots on his lungs, very, very tiny, very minuscule. They are going to increase the medication he's on a bit, which doesn't make him feel as well, all right, uh, as when it's down. So just be praying for them as they're going through that. Wanda Wood had another treatment for her cancer this week. She's down a bit this weekend. George Mannon surprised us, had surgery on Friday at St. Agnes Hospital, but he went home late yesterday. So uh, George, one of our seniors here, but he's recovering very well. I've already mentioned the Snavely and Nelms family, so please remember them for that service Tuesday. 
And then Ann Christensen family, that's a service we have at the end of the week, so if you'd remember them. And then the Boitano family, uh, Danny's dad that we've requested prayer for over the past several months, uh, battling Alzheimer's, uh, no longer has that battle. And uh, he is home with the Lord, and we are so very grateful for that. And that service will be in the middle of the month. So if you would just remember those families, I know they would appreciate it very, very much. Uh, Harvest, uh, excuse me, Hope Fest. How many of you got out to the Hope Fest on Friday night? Good. What would you think? What would you think? Have a good time, huh? Good. All right. I hear we had about 300 during the night. Come, all right. Four different churches. Uh, brought worship teams and worship bands and just uh, celebrated uh, worship together, a sign of unity to the community. And uh, Shelly and I could not be here. We were already committed to a wedding over on the coast from a former member of our church. So uh, here's what Shelly and I did get to experience, though, that we had forgotten all about. Rain. It rained on Saturday for an outdoor wedding. <laughs> it had been on the uh, calendar all week. It was going to rain Saturday, okay? Not Friday, not Sunday, but Saturday. Everybody kept hoping it would blow away, all right? Friday, they finally had to say it's not going to go away. It's coming. Just, just I want to make you all feel better today. Do you know what it cost the father of the bride to get a tent there on short notice for 200 people? How much? $9,400. $9,400. Don't y'all feel better now? You were not the father of that bride. <laughs> yeah, all the rain showing up there. Yeah. Uh, but it was beautiful, and we had a grand time, and uh, God was honored, and a couple is now married, uh, Sheena. Some of you may remember Sheena Eklund. She attended here until after she graduated from college, got a job up in the Bay Area. And so, uh, anyway, it was a joy and a privilege. But we kept getting pictures and little video clips from Friday night. Looks like you all had a grand time, and we were so excited about that. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward and wait on us as we have our morning ties and offering, and, uh, and then we'll get into our worship. Would you look at this? All right. Well, I can tell you this. The two in the middle are a whole lot better looking than the two on the sides. But uh, <laughs> let's pray. Father, we love you. We are grateful for your love for us. It is what makes all the difference in the world to us. Not only do you make a difference in the way in which we live each day and each moment of every day, but Father, that reality also enables us to face eternity with a right perspective. And so we thank you for all that you have done on our behalf and all that you want to, to do in a relationship with us. Father, we trust you with needs, and the needs here today are varied. There are needs of students who, who have tests coming up, and we commit those needs to you. There are needs of young people who are dealing with things like rejection and bullying, criticism. There are young people who have to deal with failures of friendships and even failures in families. And so, Father, we pray for them for a strength and a courage that's out of this world. We pray that they will experience your hope in the midst of your strength, which lets them know that you have something better for them. Father, we have young adults who are struggling in their, their families, their young families. Sometimes it's with health issues. Sometimes it's with time pressures. Sometimes it's just with relationships. So we, we pray for them, Lord, that as young adults, they'll have a perspective longer than just today or just this week. Father, they can see a bigger picture. They will run the race of their life with patience. Father, there are those who are middle-aged in life and they are facing challenges like they never have before, a career ending and uncertain about another career, retirement. There are some whose nests are empty and they haven't been empty for a long time. They're grappling with issues. I pray they will turn to you for leadership and guidance and direction. There are those, Father, in the later seasons of life, the autumn, the winter days. They're facing the prospects that just time itself, and as we know it here, is running out. And may they face that with great ambition. May they say, as Paul did, I have run the race and I'm about to finish the course and I'm thrilled with the race that I've run. I'm thrilled with the end result. Give us an eternal perspective today, Father, as we worship, 
as we pray and as we preach. Give us an eternal perspective, Father, as we give. Father, you love a cheerful giver. You love a hilarious giver. You love, live, you love one who gives with an eternal perspective, not just a temporary one. So thank you. In Christ's name, we surrender all these needs. The needs for faith, the needs for strength, the needs for healing, the needs for sorrow. You're big enough for them all. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning. It's great to see you here. Uh, let me do a little, uh, little catch-up on our homework. How many of you read chapter 10 and believe that you did better than the 8 o'clock service? They were weak. They were weak this morning. Y'all did good. All right. Uh, if you're new to New Hope, we're in the middle of a series. Actually, we are one-third finished. We have finished the first leg of the Triple Crown, all right? You know, on horse racing, there are three major races, all right? You got the uh, Kentucky Derby, then you have the... And then you have the... Well, are y'all too much, know too much about horse racing. Right. No, but we got those three. Well, we have just finished the Kentucky Derby. That is the first ten key truths of the Bible. These are the truths that we build our life on, the foundation that how we act and who we are stems from. And so it's been very important for us to lay this foundation. If you missed any of these previous 10 weeks, go to the website. You can get caught up. Make sure you read the chapter. How many of you who didn't read chapter 10 this week will catch up by next week? Come on, be honest. All right? I'm going to ask you next week if you're caught up. Okay? doesn't take long, but this is important, folks. This is foundational to the Christian life. Know what we build our life on. Jesus told a parable. You can build your life on, on, on shifting sand, or you can build your life on a rock. And the rock are the truths of the Scripture, and these ten are most foundational. In fact, let's just review them for a quick moment. Uh, our first key truth that we looked at was... Amen. God. God, good. Woo. You guys have your word there for a moment. God, the key idea, I believe the God of the Bible is the only true God. There are lots of gods in this world you have to choose from, but there is only one true, living, eternal God. He is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The second truth we looked at is this God who is, is personal. He wants to have a relationship with you. He just not abandon us. He's not just some entity way out there that we can't reach or touch. He has gone to great lengths to be personal with us. And the key idea, I believe God is involved in and cares about my daily life. The third key truth we looked at is God who is and this God who is personal explains how we can have a relationship with Him and is on the basis of Salvation. salvation. Key idea, I believe a person comes into a right relationship with God by His grace through faith in Jesus Christ. We discovered how this God who is, is personal, and how He wants to have a relationship with. We can find about all of this where? In the Bible. In the Bible. The Bible is God's holy word. I believe the Bible is the word of God, and because it is, it has the right to command my belief, and my action. Let me say that one strongly. It has the right, because it is the Word of God, to command my belief, my action, and my behavior. Number five, out of the Bible, we find out that when we enter into a personal relationship with this personal God through salvation, that we now have what? An identity, An identity in Christ. We are no longer a sinner, but we are now a, a saint. You can look in front of a mirror. If you have been born again, you have salvation in your life. Christ lives in you. You can look in a mirror and say, I am holy. I am saved. I am a saint. I am holy. Not by my own righteousness, but the righteousness of the one who lives within me. The key idea, I believe I am significant because of my position as a child of God. Those five key truths all are impacted by our love for God. Once we have experienced this love for God, now His life in us will bring about some things that help us fulfill the second command. First command, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Second command is like to it, love your neighbor as you love yourself. 
So these next five key truths out of the Bible impact the way we love others. And we looked at key truth number six, which is church. the church. Good. Y'all have your table of contents open, don't you? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, good. That's good. That's good. All right, yeah, the church. The key idea here is I believe the church is God's primary way to accomplish his purposes on earth. And we are not just talking about the local place called New Hope. We are talking about the church global, the church universal, the church invisible. All of us who have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, we are, whether we want to be or not, part of the church. Because that's his family. And then we look at what it means to be part of a local fellowship, the way in which God touches our, our neighborhoods, our city, our state, our nation, and impacts the world. Number seven. Now that we know who we are and we're part of this family, life's not perfect. We still have to deal with something. What's it called? Amen. Our humanity. Paul described it well in the book of Romans. There is within me a desire to do good that I can't do. And there's a desire in me to do what I don't want to do, but I do do. All right? <laughs> and that's what it all ends up looking like. So how do I, how do I deal with a civil war inside my life? So we have to still deal with humanity, but it doesn't win. They sang a great song about it. There is victory. There is victory for, for our lives over self. Number eight, when the love of God is in us, it's going to be expressing itself through us. And we call that compassion. The key idea, I believe God calls all Christians to show compassion to people in need. We are not to run from problems. We are to be like firefighters. We are to run to the flames. We're to run to where the problem is. That's the reason there's a ministry to the homeless. We are running to where those needs are. There is a reason that we have people engaged in, in, in homes around town for unwed mothers. It's because it's where the needs are. It's the reason we have people engaged in ministry that go behind prison walls. Because why? That's where the fire is. There are reasons we have people going to Africa, even though there are things posted about Ebola. Why? Because that is what Christians do. We run to where the fire is. That's compassion. Number nine, last week on Pastor Appreciation Day, stewardship. Yeah, wasn't that a great subject on that day? I believe everything I am and everything I own belongs to God. And the number 10 is where we are today, eternity. I believe there is a heaven I believe there is a hell, and let me pause. If you believe what the Bible says about heaven, you can't say there is no hell. Otherwise, you cannot have faith that there is a heaven. I believe there is a heaven, and I believe there is a hell, and that Jesus will return to judge all people and establish his eternal kingdom. And that's what we're going to look at today. And the reason we are learning, discovering, building our lives on these truths is not so we can be better at debating theology, but so we can live truthfully. We don't learn these truths so that we can defend God in the public marketplace, but we learn these truths so we can express faith in the way in which we live. We don't learn these truths so we can win an argument, but we live these truths so somebody will see in us a hope that they want to have and another soul will be saved, another life will be changed. We learn these truths not to be frustrated with our failures, but to be freed from the frustrations, knowing that God can take our failures and use them for something good. A pastor visited an older man, and the pastor said, uh, Sir, at your age, you ought to be thinking about the hereafter. The older man replied, Oh, I do all the time, no matter where I am, in my living room, upstairs, in the kitchen, in the basement, I'm always asking myself, What am I here after? Yeah, Bob understands that one. Yeah. <laughs> Christian author Philip Yancey wrote this following. He said, although most of us believe in the afterlife, no one much talks about it. Christians believe we will spend eternity in a splendid place, and it's called heaven. And isn't it a little bizarre that we simply ignore heaven acting as if it doesn't matter. Does heaven matter? Does it make a difference in the way you think, in the way you live, and the choices you make? When's the last conversation you had with somebody 
about heaven. As I was preparing, I had forgotten about a picture in my Bible. Some of you have seen this picture before. Some of you have heard the story before. But it fell out this morning as I was heading to the 8 o'clock service. God, that was God's gift to me this morning. Because there are two key moments in my life where heaven became real. The first time was when I was 10 years old. And I was walking down the back steps of Winchell Elementary School on my way home. And my sister and my Aunt Pat met me to tell me that my Grandpa McLean had died of a heart attack that day. At 10, I already knew Christ. Been in church since I was four days old. Had a strong, seated belief in God and Christ and heaven. And I knew that though I could not see my grandpa again here, I knew that one day I would see him again. And though I cried and though I grieved, I, literally the, the scriptures were true for this 10-year-old boy. I, I sorrowed, but not as those who have no hope. Heaven became very real to me that day. Unfortunately, it took about 28 more years for the reality of heaven to take real root in my life. I get a call on a Monday morning at the office when I'm not supposed to be there. God has a great sense of humor. I was on my way out the door because I had forgotten something there on, sa on Sunday night and I come back in to grab it and I, I was on the way out and the phone starts to ring and I had a new answering machine. So I thought, oh, I don't need to answer that. The machine will get it. And I was about to close the door and I thought, well, maybe I should hear the message. Maybe this is important. And it was. It was my first call from Heinz Hospice. And there was a lady on the other end of the phone that said, uh, I would like to speak to Tim Rowland. I said, uh, this is Tim. And they said, uh, we got your name from a Baptist church in Kingsburg. It took me 15 years to find out who that was. I had no idea. Didn't know I knew anybody in First Baptist Church in Kingsburg. Jan Parr's no sister. 15 years later, we found that out. She said, one of our nurses was in a Sunday school class yesterday morning, and the prayer request was, Heinz Hospice needs a younger pastor to go visit a new patient. That time, Heinz was very small. They had one volunteer pastor. He was 81 or 82, and they had a 19-year-old patient, and they said, we need a younger. I qualified 23 years ago as a younger <laughs> pastor. And I said, sure, I'll go see her. And I went to see this young lady. Her name was Caroline Deanne Timpkin. She was a 19-year-old beauty. She had won the beauty contest in that part of Kansas, 19 miles due north of Dodge City. She was out at Fresno State because she had an uncle who lived out here in the agricultural industry, and she was going to Fresno State. It was discovered Caroline, after she got out here, had leukemia. They fought it. It went into remission. In just a couple of months, it came raging back. There was no longer anything they could do to treat Caroline. I had dealt with death before. I had been there when others had died, but I've never been through a hospice process. Knowing this long in advance, I didn't know Caroline. I remember walking up the steps to her apartment over off of, um, I think between Shaw and Barstow and Fresno Street. I remember walking up the steps that first day, terrified, scared, and saying, God, what am I going to do? As I, stood on, as I stood on the entrance to her door, all of a sudden clarity and thought came, and it was as if God was saying, Tim, this is bigger than you and Caroline. You just, you just be patient. I've got something more. I knocked on the door. Caroline's mama opened the door took me in and introduced me to Caroline. She was sitting on the couch there in her living room and her hair was all gone. But she had this cute little turban on her head and she was just as pretty as this picture. Big radiant smile. And I sat down and I said, Caroline, I got to tell you, I'm kind of new at this. I don't know if that made her feel any better or not. But <laughs> I said, tell me what you want from me. What is it that I can do for you at this time of life? And she said, oh, Tim, she said, I grew up in church. She said, I was in Sunday school every Sunday. She said, but I just didn't think I'd need to know much about heaven yet, so I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to those lessons. 
could you just come and teach me about where I'm going? 19. 19. Can you teach me about where I'm going? I breathed a big sigh of relief because I thought she was going to ask me the question, why is God doing this to me? And that's a question I you can answer, but it, nobody likes the answer. I said, oh, Caroline, I can teach you about heaven. I said, oh, man, I'm excited. But I'd never have approached the study of heaven like I did as we got ready. I said, Caroline, how often do you want me to come? She said, could you come every day? I said, sure, I'll do my very best. And so every day, almost, for the next two to three weeks, I went and saw Caroline. Caroline was... Um, Sitting up on the couch those first two weeks, she'd meet me at the dining room table, her mom would be there, and we would just study the scriptures, just verse after verse, passage after passage about heaven. She'd ask questions, and she'd listen to answers, and she'd smile, and we'd cry. And then the following week, Caroline couldn't leave her bedroom. I'd have to go sit in a chair by her bed, and what used to be hour visits became 20-minute visits. Uh, those first couple of weeks, too, I got to where I took Brant and Chad. They were... Uh, they were just about seven and five. And I thought she would enjoy the kids, and I thought this would be a great experience for them. And Chad remembered it actually at 8 o'clock very clearly this morning. And so that third week, as I sat there at her bedside, it went from 20 minutes to 15 to 10. And one day, she said, uh, Tim, I got, a, I got a big favor to ask. I said, Caroline, I'll do my very best. She said, w when I die, and she said, it's not going to be long. She said, would you go to Jetmore, Kansas and preach my funeral? I said, oh, Caroline, you, you have honored me more than you know. And I said, but, but you've got a pastor there. He's known you since you were little, and I, I think he ought to do that. And she said, no, I don't. I said, what do you mean? You know? She said, he retired since I moved here, and he moved away. They got a new guy. He doesn't know me at all. I said, wow. I said, Caroline, I said, I will do my very best. If at all possible, I will. But why is it so important that I go and preach your funeral? Listen to this. She said, Tim, those folks know how I lived. You will know how I died. You go tell them. You go tell them. You tell those young people, don't ignore the Sunday school lessons on heaven because it's important. You have no idea how soon you're going to need it. On a Sunday morning, about four days later, her mama calls me at the church. And she says, Caroline is worshiping in heaven this morning. Whew. We had a grand time at Ashbrook that morning. I sat down with the board and said, I got to get to Jetmore, Kansas by Thursday. It is going to cost an arm and a leg to fly there. And I said, tell you what, guys, you put new tires on my Chevy Sprint. <laughs> I said, I'll drive there and I won't even miss a Sunday. I got in the car on Tuesday morning and I drove to Jetmore, Kansas, and I got to tell you what, Chevy Sprint averaged about 48 miles a gallon. I did good, but one tank, I averaged 58 miles a gallon. I had a CB in those days, and I was called the California Kid. And as I was dr driving, I was talking, and a trucker came on, and he said, he, he said, California Kid, you're going awful fast. I said, I got an important place to be. And he said, where are you going? I told him, he said, why are you going there? And I told him the story of Caroline, as I've told you today. I had about six truckers crying on the CBs, all right? <laughs> and two of them said, get in the saddle. They put me right in between two of those, and they just sucked me right down the road, man. <laughs> 58 miles again, I'll never forget it. I got there, and I preached a funeral. We ended with a graveside service. At the end of the service, I was asked the pastor there if he would make a closing comment and pray. And before I turned it over to him, I looked at the crowd. There were probably 300 people. Almost everybody in town knew her. And I said, when the pastor closes here, I said, I'll be standing over there underneath that oak tree, November 22nd or 23rd. And I said, I'll stand under that oak tree. And I said, if I can pray with you, answer questions, this is... This is all about Caroline and Christ today. So I walked over there and the pastor prayed and I had my head bowed. And when I raised my head, I had a line of about 40 to 50 people. And for the next hour, hour and a half, I talked, I visited, I prayed. And there were two ladies who kept letting other people go ahead of them and they wanted to be last. 
when those little two ladies were last, there was nobody else ahead of them. They both just came up and they enveloped me. I was like a piece of ham between two slices of white bread. <laughs> and they laughed and they cried and they giggled and they cried. And when they finished, they said, you have no idea. And all of a sudden, I started remembering what God said on the porch, Caroline's apartment. This is bigger than you two. And these two ladies with tears streaming down their face, they said, both of us lost our daughters in the last 12 months, and we have been non-functional. We came to this service today not because we attended the church, not because we even knew Caroline very well. We just knew the story. And we had hopes that God could somehow say something to us. And he did. And at that moment, I gave thanks that this idea of heaven and eternity not only impacts us after we die, but it changes the course of our life while we live. And I told God that day I would never take eternity for granted again. Jesus wrote these words to us so that we would not take it for granted. When he said, do not let your hearts be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me, for in my Father's house there's a whole lot of rooms. It never ends. And if this wasn't the truth, I would have told you. And I'm going to prepare a place for you. For you. For you. We get our own room. We don't have to share it with anybody else. Because we share all the Father's house. Most of you remember Steve McQueen, right? Actually, do any of you on the front row have any idea who Steve McQueen was? I got one head nodding. That's because your parents used to watch old movies, okay? Yeah, Steve McQueen, great actor. Uh, this, guy, this guy played in a lot of rough and tumble movies, all right? Steve McQueen, top actor, led a life as tough as the characters he portrayed on the screen. Success filled his life until alcohol and a failed marriage left him empty and in despair. In this frame of mind, he attended a crusade of Billy Graham's in Los Angeles. And at that crusade, Steve McQueen gave his life to Jesus Christ. He had asked one of Billy Graham's officials if there was any chance that Steve could have a private visit with Billy. He had some questions. And he said, Billy Graham has already left L.A., but let's see what we can arrange. And two weeks later, Billy Graham was flying through LAX, and he had a lengthy layover. And Steve McQueen, that, that was before all the stuff you have at airports now. And so Billy met him out in the parking lot and he sat in Steve McQueen's limousine. And for two hours, Steve McQueen fired questions at Billy Graham. You see, Steve McQueen just couldn't believe that God could forgive him of all he had done in his life. And Billy gave him verse after verse after verse. And none of them clicked until Billy got to Titus 1-2. And here's what Titus says. The hope of eternal life which God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago. That clicked in Steve's mind. No, God can't lie. And if God has said he's forgiven me, then I'm forgiven. I like that. But Billy, do you have a pen I could borrow? I want to write that down. Billy said, no, you can't borrow my pen. Billy took his own pen and he underlined the verse in his Bible. And he said, Billy, you can't have my pen, but you can have my Bible. Months later, Steve McQueen was diagnosed with cancer. Steve had the money, so he went to every possible place you can imagine trying to get treatment for his cancer. He even ended up in Mexico for experimental treatment. None of it worked. Late one night, he could barely talk, but he summoned the nurse, and he asked for his Bible. The nurse thought he was going to read for a while, so she left the room, and about 20 minutes, she came back, and Steve McQueen had died. Open Bible on his chest. Titus 1, 2. Finger on verse 2. A God who cannot lie promised long ago heaven. In light of all that Christ has done for us and all the provisions He's made possible, what should we then believe about the days in our future? The key question for today is, what is going to happen to us in the future? Another way to ask that question is, what do I believe happens when I die? It is often our thoughts about this question, question about key truth number 10, eternity. What is there that prompts us to think about God? Quite often until we're confronted, like Caroline, with our imminent death, we often don't think a whole lot about key truth number one, God. 
Jeremy Taylor said, God has given man a short time here upon the earth, and yet upon this short time, eternity depends. The Christian is on the other side of the dilemma of the soul. We now are looking to build God's kingdom for the time that we will spend in eternity as well as preparing others for that moment in their life. So the key idea out of the key question is, I believe there is a heaven and a hell that Jesus will return to judge all people and to establish His eternal kingdom. I believe there is a heaven and a hell that Jesus will return to judge all people and to establish His eternal kingdom. You see, the central belief about our future and eternity is that when we die, our bodies return to the earth, but our spirit lives on. And they go to be with God in one of two places. They go to be with God in heaven, or they go to be with the enemy in hell. Even though I'm a pastor, i got to be honest, I don't like the part about hell very well. I never have. And i got a sneaking suspicion I probably never ever will. My job, and even the way others perceive us pastors, would be easier if hell were not part of the gospel message. But as we previously discussed about the Bible, we have to take God's truth as a total work and even accept the areas that we wish were not there. Of course, for those of us who have received Christ's offer of salvation by grace, we no longer need to be afraid about this matter anymore. We can understand what David said, when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because he has removed this fear from our future. And I want you to stop and realize something very important, folks. Part of what makes the gospel the gospel, what does gospel mean? Good news. Part of what makes the gospel such good news is not only is there a heaven to gain, that's good news, but part of, part of what makes that even better news is there is a hell to avoid. I don't have to go there. I can go there. And that is a choice that I get to make. Let me emphasize an important point here. When we die and we go into eternity, this moment is not the end, as many tend to believe. It is an incredible brand new beginning. Jesus Christ one day is going to return to this earth and His first order of business will be to judge mankind. When Jesus returns, He will make all of the injustice go away and He will deal with it righteously. Everything will come under His authority. All those things that we thought were unfair in life, God will make right. Christ's followers at that moment, then, then we'll receive an imperishable, resurrected body just as Jesus Christ now has. Jesus and His people will reside on a new earth that is yet to come, surrounded by a new heaven. For the Christian, this is our future. When we say the best is yet to come, we can confidently mean what we say. Some of you have heard the old story. The elderly woman who was dying, she asked for a pastor to come visit her before she died. And she said, Pastor, I have two requests to make of you. There are two things I want you to make sure are done before I die. Yes, what is it? I want to make sure that when I die, you make sure that they put in my casket with me my Bible in my right hand and a fork in my left hand. He looked at her and he says, Ma'am, I understand why you want your Bible in your right hand because that is what has sustained you throughout all of your life. You've based your life on the Word in that book. But I do not understand the fork in your left hand. She said, Pastor, you're to blame for that. He said, what do you mean? She says, because of all the potlucks at the church, after we've had the main dish, you tell everybody, hey, hold on to your forks. The best is yet to come. <laughs> and she said, when people walk by my casket, I want them to know the best is yet to come. Caroline Timpkin discovered the best was still in her future. My mama, though 81, had a great life for 81 years, knew the best was still ahead of her. On this great day, when Jesus comes back for the last and final time to make all things right, He will live amongst us and that original garden of three will expand into a great city of millions. Listen to what the psalmist wrote in 93 verses 1 and 2. The Lord reigns. And he is robed in majesty, and he's armed with strength, and the world is established firm and secure, and your throne was established long ago. You are from all eternity. 
And then in Revelation 5, 11 through 13, I looked and I heard the voices of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousands times ten thousands. How many angels is that? How about a whole bunch? That's just a lot of them. And they encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and in a loud voice they are singing, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And that's what we're going to talk about next week, by the way, is worship. And then I heard every creature in heaven and earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and glory and honor and power forever and ever. So here's a key application. What difference does this view of eternity make in the way I live today? What difference does it make? How should we live now in light of what we know about the future? What we need to realize is that what we think about de heaven determines significantly how we should live today. C.S. Lewis. Again, y'all know who I'm talking about? C.S. Oh, good job, guy. Oh, I know, Chronicles of Narnia, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Screw tape ladders. Okay, good. That's a, that's a grand one. C.S. Lewis, in case you don't know, once an atheist, meant a member, one of the most brilliant men who's ever lived, Atheist for many years became a Christian after he studied the resurrection. What a transforming life he's been for so many. Listen to what this brilliant man, atheist turned believer, wrote. He said, it is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this one. That hurts, doesn't it? You see, it's easy for us to get so swamped with things here on earth, so squeezed by our jobs, finances are tight, relationships going sour. When those kinds of things are happening, it's not easy to meditate on the glories of heaven. Every one of us wants to make a good investment. We want to get the biggest bang for our buck. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you the best investment that are, are those that are safe and permanent. And if we are wise, we will spend our time preparing for that which lasts forever. What is life but preparation for eternity? What is life but a dressing room? For heaven if we truly believe that god has prepared an eternal home for us a house with many rooms as jesus explained in john 14 then we can and will do at least three things here they are number one we will live with hope every day if we know that if death occurred the very next minute i was going to heaven would that not bring hope we would live with hope every day regardless of the circumstances around us and folks i got news for you it's not going to get better. We may have brief moments, okay, of improvement. The stock market may go up for a while, but it is. I, I'm going to tell you, this world may have peace momentarily here and there, but Jesus will come when it's at its worst. We can know that God's home awaits for us. So live with hope every day. Number two, love people with freedom and boldness because our future is secure in Him. Our future is not based on whether others accept or reject us. Our future and self-worth and ability to love is not based on how we feel today. It is based on the fact that God says, I love you and I've prepared a place for you and you have prepared my heart for me so we can love with boldness. Live with hope. Love people with freedom and boldness. And last of all, we can lead more people into a relationship with Christ because we want to share this great hope with them. I'm going to ask you for the next minute and a half to do a, a little homework for me. I'm going to ask you to take inventory of your closest relationships. Your friends and your family, people you know. I'm not asking you to think about any strangers. Your closest relationships. How many of those closest relationships do not have faith in Jesus Christ? These are people within your sphere of influence and they have no relationship with Christ. And of these non-Christians who you're thinking about right now, how many are you actively sharing God's love with? Are there names? Are there names on your list? It's important to express here. Even if you can't think of a name, this exercise is not intended to create condemnation or blame. But the absence of a name should produce a sense of conviction in a Christ follower's life. 
if you have no names or maybe just one, then the motivation here today is to gain a hunger and a drive to see somebody that you love come to faith in Christ. There is no condemnation for what has not happened, but conviction today towards obedience to see what could happen if you live with hope and love people with boldness and actively seek to be engaged in leading them to Christ. If you have no names, don't wallow and waste any more time in misery. Simply rise up and realize you have a mission. If however you wrote down several names, be encouraged that God is working on your behalf to use you, your very word and your very actions to bring these people to him. Keep praying, be inspired, don't give up. Imagine one day each person giving a testimony of how you were part of the process that brought them to freedom in eternity. Also know you were simply part of a salvation process in these lives. God will most definitely use you if you submit and serve him. Paul described well to the church in Corinth his partnership of working with Apollos to reach people. While the work of salvation is up to God who is the gardener, listen to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3, 5-7. through What after all or who after all is Apollos? He's a great preacher. And, 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 and who or what is Paul? Uh, we're only servants through whom you all have come to believe. As the Lord has assigned each to his task. I, I planted seed, Apollos watered seed, but God caused it to grow. So neither the one who plants or the one who waters is anything, but God is everything. Are you being nothing for God? Are you, are you planting? Are you watering some? I'll never forget, I hate to embarrass him, I don't think I will, but I'll never forget Tim Belcher's story. I'll never forget a daughter-in-law taking a father-in-law to lunch. And saying to him over lunch, I can't bear to watch your son cry every night as we go to bed. Wow, what are you talking about? As he prays, he cries because he can't bear the thought of spending eternity without his father being there. And that was a seed that was planted in a neighbor across the street whose life was changed because of health concerns. And he walks across, where are you going to church? I need to find God works all things together to bring us to a point. God took a daughter-in-law and a neighbor across the street and seeds were planted and water was poured on and God has transformed his life. Let me wrap this up. Imagine somebody inviting you to a party. I found part and kind of, this is a story. This is kind of an allegory. I came across part of it, rewrote part of it. And this is weird. Shelly and I had some time to waste and we watched a movie. It was a big mama movie. Hey. And I actually, there's a scene in that story that is almost this story. I couldn't believe it. I'm, watching, I'm saying, I just wrote this. How did they get it on TV already? Where's my cut? Here's the story. Imagine somebody takes you to a party and you see friends there and you enjoy a couple of good conversations, some laughter, some, some pretty decent appetizers. The party's all right, but you're hoping it'll get better and you hope maybe after another hour and more folks show up, it will. And suddenly the friend who brought you says, I got to take you home. You mean right now? Yeah, now. You're disappointed. I mean, nobody ever wants to be the first one to leave the party. Then you get called a party pooper. But you leave and your friend drops you off at your house and as you approach the door and, and you open the door, you've been feeling all alone and feeling sorry for yourself and as you open the door and you reach for the light switch, you sense somebody's in your house. Your heart is now in your throat and you flip on the light. Surprise! Your house is full of smiling people, familiar faces, it's a party and this party's for you. You smell your favorites, barbecue ribs and pecan pie coming out of the oven. The tables are full, it's a feast, and you recognize your guests, people you've not seen in a long, long time, and then one by one, the people you've most enjoyed at the other party show up at your house. This turns out to be the real party. You realize that if you had stayed longer at the other party as you wanted to, you wouldn't be at the real party. You'd be away from it. And Christians faced with a terminal illness or with imminent death, often feel like they're leaving the party before it's over. 
they feel like they're going home early. They're disappointed, thinking, thinking of all they're going to miss when they leave. But the truth is, the real party is underway at the Father's house. Precisely where they're going. They're not missing the party. The others are just left behind for now. The ultimate question is, where will you be one minute after you die? Jesus said there are two roads in life. One is a narrow gate, and it leads to heaven. One is a broad gate, and it leads to destruction and to hell. On that road, people seem to be having a wonderful time. It's a party atmosphere. But it's hollow, and it's empty, and it's lonely, and it's insecure. The narrow road, on the other hand, leads to heaven. Traveling on that road is difficult at times because it goes against the grain of society and the way we normally think. It goes against the tide of pleasures and the sins of this world. And on this road, there is fun and laughter. There's a sense of destiny and a distinction of hope and assurance of something better to follow this earthly existence. Our motto is the best is yet to come. I watched a 19-year-old live her closing days with the idea the best is yet to come. I watched my 81-year-old mama walk down that narrow road with laughter and joy in her closing moments of life. Why? Because she had the assurance the best is yet to come. Do we live and do we make choices based that way? Let's give Jesus' brother, half-brother Jude, the final say today, okay? The book of Jude, here's what he said. You, dear friends, by building yourselves up in the most holy faith, ten key truths. And praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourself in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring us to eternal life. If you died today, do you know for a fact you'd be with Jesus? If you don't, why don't you make sure right now? Let's pray. And for those of us who do know it, let's not be part of those that Lewis described that we are so ineffective in this world. Let's let our lives make a difference for the lives of others. Let's plant and let's water and let's make a difference. Let's pray. Our Father, for those hearts today that say, I don't know if I died today that I would go to heaven, listen to their cry, listen to their prayer. God, I know you will. You want them in heaven more than they want to be there. And how do we know that? Because you sent your son to make that possible. So Father, if there's a man, a woman, a young person sitting here right now who's postponed making that choice, I trust Caroline Timpkin's picture lets them know death doesn't only come when you're old. It can catch us by surprise when we're young. So, Father, I pray for that man, that woman, that person right now who's saying, Lord, I believe you are a personal God, and through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, I can go to heaven, and that the Lord Jesus Christ can come live in my heart, and I ask him to do so right now. I confess the fact that I have been a sinner. I have made my own decisions and charted my own course and gone my own way. And at this very moment, God, I want to surrender my life, all that I am, everything that I have belongs now to Him. Father, thank you that you are listening to those prayers. And at this very moment, just as a 25-year-old young man and a 25-year-old young woman in recent weeks has invited Christ in their life, I pray there are those at this very moment who are doing so. Thank you for hearing and answering their prayers. With your head still bowed for just a moment, nobody look around. This is nobody else's business. It's really not even mine. I'm just a little nosy. But if you just now made sure that if you died today, you know where eternity was for you, you did business with God in these last couple of minutes, just quickly put your hand up, back down. I'm not going to bother you. I'm not going to come to you. I'm not going to point you out. I just want to give thanks. But you prayed. You wanted to make sure I know I'm going to heaven. Put your hand up and put it right back down. And I invited Christ in my life. Father, thank you. Thank you for your presence, for all of us who know you. Father, may we allow our thoughts of heaven and eternity make a difference in the way in which we share with our family and our friends. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.